Okay, welcome. Uh, today we're here. We do not have a powered mic. Uh, I think both Jeremy and I are pretty loud. I'm not going to do much talking other than the introduction. Um, I just want to uh, quickly uh, welcome you to our very first inaugural um, uh, uh, guest speaker for the Humanities Truck Speaker Series. Uh, this is the first that we expect to have one of these every semester that's going to focus on community engaged research scholarship, uh, bringing in people from uh, around the country and the world who do this kind of work. Um, today I have this, uh, this, this uh, talk is co-sponsored um, uh, by the Humanities Lab. Uh, thank you for the director of the Humanities Lab um, for helping support this, as well as the Humanities Truck. Uh, we're we're um, if you're on the you guys there's a whole empty row here feel free to move on up there's no I mean you can sit on the floor if you want but uh, there are seats if you want them and it won't be disruptive to move up here so uh, we are very um, honored to have Jeremy Brecker come and do our first uh, of these talks he is really uh, been renowned as one of uh, uh, the he, he, the most influential people in the field of democratizing history, of doing history with uh, people, of creating a participatory process for doing history. Uh, he um, was a leading figure in the field of um, what was known as the People's History Movement in the early 80s. Um, uh, there were many reviews of his work that really called his work to be kind of the, the best. His work has been uh, he's done quite a bit of work, but the work um, that really um, uh, put him on the map of this, doing this kind of history where, where you uh, uh, really develop historical uh, thinking, historical interpretation, historical products in community, with community, for communities. Um, he did a project with the brass uh, workers in the mills in Naugatuck Valley uh, in Connecticut, and that led to a book called Brass Valley, and also a documentary on that same uh, topic. But what makes his work particularly unique is that he never stopped doing it. He's been uh, working in that community uh, for 50 years now. Uh, he's done everything from uh, museum exhibitions. He's also been very interested in the creation of uh, the, uh, I guess you might call it participatory music, of folk music, uh, folk festivals, drawing on different communities to be able to um, uh, uh, really bring out um, in a festival atmosphere uh, the particular musics that have originated from those communities. Um, and also, um, it has brought his work is our, he's been very interested from the very get go uh, in connecting kind of uh, politics that are about creating uh, just creating a better world that are connecting kind of the radical politics of, of students and uh, with uh, working people's politics. That's kind of what got him started. He founded a group called the uh, in, in the Reed chapter Reed College chapter of the students for uh, Democratic Society, SDS, um, uh, in the 1960s, and he's been doing this work ever since. But right now, he's currently working on thinking about how he was just earlier this week invited by um, Representative Ocasio-Cortez to participate in this core working group that's shaping uh, the, the Green New Deal, with a, a key piece being how do we get uh, and what's the relationship between labor and the Green New Deal uh, being a piece of that. With that said, uh, I'm going to turn over the floor to Jeremy. Well, thanks. thanks for coming. It's really nice to be with you all. Uh, and the first thing I want to say is if my voice drops and you can't hear me in the back, there's a very long, narrow space. So uh, definitely wave or throw something at me if you can't hear. Uh, uh, I'm getting a little hard of hearing myself, so I'm very sensitive to this as a handicap. That, uh, uh, and in this room, uh, even people who aren't handicapped being hard of hearing are likely to have a little difficulty uh, as we go. So 
I want to ask a few questions just to get started. How many of you have been interviewed in some way or other? Uh, school newspaper, okay, so a lot. You had the experience of being on that side. Uh, how many of you have done an interview? Okay, so really a high proportion. Okay, so we're getting, uh, uh, we're not preaching to the choir, but we're teaching the already learned. Um, how many of you are, think of yourselves as being from the DC area, uh, one way or another? So a fairly small proportion. Uh, and, but how many of you have a place, whether it's here or on the other side of the world, that you identify with, that you think as you, of as your place that, you, that you're connected with or came from? Or, so let's see. Yeah, so again, quite a large, high proportion. Um, and uh, how many of you are actually have been or are part of a community history project? So I think it's more than, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was more than that. So the last couple of days I've had the privilege of uh, being with groups that have been studying a number of uh, aspects of uh, uh, Washington related history uh, in connection with the history truck and uh, is there anyone here who's been involved in the Reno City project? I know we've got a red uh, someone with roots there but no one from the project? Okay how about uh, Shepherd's Park? No okay how about the uh, AU Women's Founders project? Okay uh, and how about Mount Vernon Square? I know we've got a few, quite a few. Good. Okay. So that's been. So we've got a lot of experience in this room already. Oh, you like? There's one more project. I'm the CCNV shelter. Oh, it's the CCNV shelter. Okay. Okay. So good. Got it. Uh, and by the way, I'm a uh, spent an incredible afternoon with Mitch Snyder. Uh, one, one day in the 1980s, just uh, going and, and talking with him and getting some feel for their operation uh, at that time. So I have a little feel for that, for that experience. Um, so I got started in doing community history, participatory uh, history when I was a tiny kid and I lived in a little community, it was just a couple dozen families, uh, and, but it had a, a collection, it made a collection, a history, like a scrapbook. Uh, and every three or four years they'd make a new volume and they'd have photos and they'd have letters that people had written and uh, t uh, 4th of July events and just the daily life of the community was documented in that way. And as a kid growing up, uh, I, I would love to pour over these old uh, photos and see the people that I knew as the 70 year olds uh, at uh, 15 or 20 making fool of them, fools of themselves uh, at, at uh, swimming hole and things of that kind. Uh, and that was kind of my uh, the germ of the idea of why should history be something that's done exclusively by uh, uh, historians? Why shouldn't it also be done by people who are out of the communities that that history is about? Um, I didn't get a chance to actually try doing it uh, until the project that Dan was describing. I, can you hear okay? Is it okay? Good. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so around 1980, I was getting to know uh, a, a, the people who had worked in an area in Western Connecticut that had been the center of the American brass industry for 150 years. And the industry was on the skids, it was sort of the, one of the leading uh, edges of deindustrialization uh, of uh, what came to be called the Rust Belt. Uh, and um, 
So I met some other people who were involved with that community, and we said, let's do a history of the, pro of the people of the brass industry and what was known as the Brass Valley uh, while it's still there. And, um, the, 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 and then we came up, why not, well I should say, I had written a book before called Strike that was a labor history book and it covered 150 years of American labor history. And I didn't talk to any workers or anyone who had been involved with that experience uh, as I was doing it. It was completely written in the uh, loft of a library uh, uh, from books and documents and whatever I could get for old records. And when I was done, I said, there's something screwed up about this way of working. And uh, I'm, I, I'm now just working on the 50th anniversary edition of the book. I still like the book, but I also feel like this was not the only way and necessarily the best way to do history that's essentially about ordinary folks. So uh, we created dreamed up the idea, and it's now it's, a, uh, it's an idea that's being revived as shown by the, the projects that I was mentioning and the work that various people here are doing. But at that time, it was quite an original, unusual thing to even think about, the idea that uh, history would involve not only professional historians, but would also involve uh, the members of the communities that they were studying and writing about. Uh, so we decided we would do that. Um, and the only problem is we had no clue how to do it. Uh, we said, well, we'll organize history committees in local unions and senior centers, and we will have an advisory panel. And that was about as far as we, we got. Uh, in think, advance thinking of how we would do this. Uh, we had only one model to go on. There were some people in Lowell, uh, Massachusetts, which had been the center of the shoe industry uh, in, the United, in uh, the United States. And um, uh, they were also organizing uh, a uh, uh, community-based history project about the shoe industry uh, and we went up uh, to see talk to them and see the event they organized and one of the community members who had been the secretary of the union local and was now the secretary of the retirees local uh, said to them you have to provide food because people who are retired shoe workers are living on very low incomes and the prospect of a meal is a really attractive thing to them. And then the second thing is she started saying to the people who came, uh, let, um, uh, are you coming, to the people who came through the, the <laughs> retirees office, are you coming to the reunion? And we had, the people who were organized this, had not thought of it as a reunion. They thought of it as a history day where people would come and give their testimony and so on. But she was the one that looked at this and said, well, the way to make sense of this for people is this is a reunion. This is a chance to get together with your old friends and acquaintances and people that you worked with for all these decades uh, in the shoe mills, shoe factories, and to join, join with them and to tell your stories to each other and to these nice young kids that are coming here uh, to do this project. So that was, uh, those are the two great gems of wisdom that we had to guide us. And it gave us a whole way of thinking about what we were doing that we hadn't had. Uh, first of all, that we had to provide something back. We couldn't just say, oh, we're wonderful people who are here to help you tell your stories for people for whom that was why should they tell their stories? And the other was finding a ways that we could make what we were doing meaningful in terms of the uh, community that we were, that we were uh, hoping, hoping to be working with. So 
I could obviously talk endlessly about the Brass Workers History Project, uh, but let me just give a few uh, sort of guidelines that we came away with um, uh, for thinking about doing this kind of work. First of all, to me, the beginning and end of uh, wisdom about doing these kinds of community projects is respect. And you see many people, if they come out of uh, uh, an academic background, for example, uh, who unfortunately have not, have been brainwashed into thinking that they're uh, in some way more knowledgeable or, more, or superior to the people that they're going out to, to interview and talk with. Uh, and the um, uh, people, any, anybody can pick that up immediately. And, you're going to, and that will immediately be a barrier to any kind of work of this kind. The, the, the key, the alter, core of the alternative, as I think about it, is that the people you're going to interview, the people you're going to be talking with, are the real experts on the subjects that you're trying to find out about. If you're trying to find out about, in our case, uh, how the workers in the brass plants uh, organize themselves to have uh, uh, both more control on the job, to have unions so that they could negotiate over getting a living wage. The people who really knew that story were the people who had worked in the, in the plants, and there were, no one else was really an expert on that, least of all those of us who were going in uh, to, to try to uh, uh, record and report on this story. Uh, similarly, um, the cultures and various kinds of institutions of the immigrant groups in the community we didn't know anything about and we really couldn't read a book or talk to an expert who really understood very much about the 10 or 15 different ethnic groups that form the core of the, the uh, uh, life of these communities. So they were the experts, that was the, the core. Um, another thing that relates to that is um, uh, how much is learning. Um, they're the experts and the assumptions and views you have uh, that you go in with may not be the right framework for understanding. We were doing a labor history project. That was our definition of what we were up to. And um, a number of people uh, that were our informants, the people who were working with us uh, on the project from, from that community, took us aside and uh, said, as one of them put it, you know, uh, you're never going to understand this community if you just approach it from the point of view of a labor story. That's part of the story, but Waterbury, that's the main city of this area, uh, in the old days, it was all sectioned off. That's a local phrase that people used there. And people didn't mingle too good. Mingle was another word they used for, uh, uh, it was sectioned off and, and people mingled or didn't mingle across the lines of the Lithuanian or Polish or African American or uh, 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 French Canadian communities. Um, and if you want to understand what was going on, you have to understand that. And it turned out that that was completely true. Even for doing a labor project, we learned that, for example, the early strikes and unions uh, were actually organized by ethnic groups. So there's a general strike in this community in 1920, uh, and they had different sections for about seven or eight or nine different uh, people, uh, peoples, ethnic groups that's, that spoke different languages, so they had the meetings in different languages, and then they had a, a council that represented all of, all of them, rather than having, for example, a different uh, 
uh, play a, a organization for people who worked in each factory, which is what you would think would be the natural thing for a union. Uh, well, we never would have understood that if people hadn't taken us aside and said, um, okay, here's something you need to understand about this community. And then we gradually realized that, yes, that was really completely right. Um, another part of it is it's very easy to have um, stereotypes about types of people. So, oh yeah, an, an old Italian woman is going to be like such and such. Uh, and um, uh, that's something that all of us, I think, have to constantly fight against. Is we live, stereotypes are a natural thing to have about all kinds of people. Um, the most uh, uh, abrupt experience I ever had with this was that you all, usually when I do an interview, very often I'll start out by saying, well, tell me a little about your family, uh, and then I'll kind of pause, and they can pick that up and respond to it however they want to. It's a very open-ended question. They can say, my family came from Italy, or they can say, you know, uh, my family were very mean to me when I was a kid, or whatever they want to say. So I did it for the 150th time, and the woman I was interviewing said, well, I don't know anything about my family because I'm an orphan. And um, so, and I had no idea what to say next. It was uh, nonplussed in a way that I just didn't, didn't have any idea. And fortunately, she immediately came to my salvation and said, uh, well, of course, there's the family that I was raised in. I could tell you about them. Would you like that? And of course, I said, yes, that would be great. Um, but the, uh, the struggle against one's own stereotypes is a constant part of this work. Um, so after we did the uh, Brass Workers History Project, we did a book and a movie uh, which were very much designed for the local communities and the wider community uh, statewide, which was filled with people who had left the Naugatuck Valley because there were no, there were no jobs, uh, but still had a strong identification with this place as the place they had come from. And also for other communities and uh, work groups, other places uh, who had very parallel uh, experiences, even though the, the nitty gritty details were different. So we made the book and the documentary we showed the documentary in community meetings up and down the valley. I should say uh, that two other quick things about doing it. We had, um, uh, in the interviews, one of the things we did is we just assumed the people we were interviewing, as I said before, were experts and we weren't just collecting facts from them. Uh, or even just, well, I remember that such and such happened and such and such happened. but we tried to draw out their interpretations of the meaning of the experiences that they had had. Uh, so um, the uh, way in which the guy in the Lithuanian community said, um, uh, well, our, our role in this community was transformed by, I said, what's the biggest change you ever experienced here? expecting something about the closing of the factories or something like that. He said, Vatican II, um, the uh, c coming of uh, uh, the reform in the Catholic Church. It's a highly Catholic city. Um, and I said, why was that so important? He said, if you were Lithuanian, you became equal to the Irish. The Irish priest couldn't kick you around anymore because you were Lithuanian yeah. instead of Irish. Again, something I wouldn't have thought even to, to think about at asking. Um, so there, the, the people we were talking to were also interpreters in collaboration with us, and we'll get to that. And we created a, a community advisory panel which reviewed the materials, the book and the materials for the movie as we went forward, and gave their input and comments and criticisms. And, uh, were collaborative partners in those in those processes. Um, so, um, <clears throat> one of the main questions that people 
ask about this stuff is what's the point? Why, why do this? What's the reasons for it? And in a little less, you know, hostile manner, uh, does it have an impact? What are the, is there, are there effects to it? Or is it just a sort of nice feel good experience that allows people to uh, be nostalgic, have a little nostalgic uh, revival of their, um, uh, of their earlier lives? And um, so I tried to think through some of the things that I think of as impacts. Interestingly, the first two or three years when we did it and soon after it, uh, I, had, I thought that the impacts were really pretty limited. But as I continued to work in that area, in that neighbor, uh, uh, region, uh, I've gradually come to see more and more impacts. Um, when we did the uh, ethnic music project, we had a series of festivals with uh, the musicians and, and largely organized by the community music activists. Uh, cultural, ethnic cultural activists, the people who organized the picnics and organized the uh, Lithuanian Day or the uh, Black History Day uh, or the exhibit in the Lithuanian uh, club, uh, social club about the history of the community. Uh, they were kind of the background. What we did was to bring them together and have them be the background of this ethnic music uh, festival and research project. And they, um, uh, uh, were brought the musicians that their community recognizes, their musicians. We didn't, unlike most folk festival type things, we did not bring in headliners from out of town who would draw a big crowd. We brought the musicians who were the people that played at the dances or the church choir or the other musical uh, uh, elements of their communities. Uh, and then we had a series of uh, festivals for everyone, for the city. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of one of them, there was a guy from the city who was setting up the bleachers in the park. And he came over to me and he said, what, uh, uh, what's this all about? So I explained what we were doing. And um, he said, oh, uh, you know, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, and I should, just, I should say, there had just been a horrible uh, racial confrontation in, Bronxville, in, uh, in uh, Brownsville in New York City. It was national headlines, um, the, the people killed, and so on. And uh, so he, when I explained the project, he said, um, oh, that's the kind of thing you want to do if you wanted to prevent something like what happened in Brownsville. And I thought, OK, I get it. We're on the right, we're on the right track here. And many people commented on how the, the uh, festivals and the other part. We did a long series of radio programs and a TV show and various other things uh, about the, the ethnic music. And many people commented on this as a means to make people in a, in a city, in a community that had very, very high level of racial tension uh, and inter-ethnic tension and uh, just a hard, hard community. Um, uh, this was a vehicle for people to, to say, well, there's a value to being with people who are different. Uh, a re, uh, another piece had to do with uh, the, um, uh, as today, this was also a time of a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. Uh, it rises and falls often in conjunction with economic cycles. And this uh, early 80s period was definitely a time nationally of, of anti-immigrant sentiment. And we did a lot in our project with uh, previous generations of immigrants and the various kinds of discrimination they had faced. And many of the people in the town at the time we were working there were the descendants of those people and had heard stories about uh, signs saying, no Irish need apply, or similar kinds of things. And um, uh, so we used that history as a way of 
fomenting a community dialogue and a degree of consciousness about, well, anti-immigrant sentiment, this, is this something we really can, can we see this from another point of view? Um, the, with the Ethnic Music Project, again, a time of war and international conflict and a lot of uh, uh, America first type thinking then as today. And we used this Ethnic Music Festival and the things we were doing as a way of talking about how lucky we were to be linked to communities all over the world. And this connected us with people in, in Africa and people in Latin America and many different countries in Europe and Canada. And that was a, uh, a way of making, uh, uh, we had, a, uh, uh, we had uh, lemons and we made lemonade out of it in, in those kinds of, in terms of giving a different possible kind of interpretation of what it meant to be in a, in a multi-ethnic community. Uh, and when we first started working there, uh, there was a almost a widespread uh, narrative about why the brass industry was closing and had, why the brass plants had closed, which was uh, the workers were too demanding. They demanded they wouldn't uh, give concessions to the companies, and therefore they couldn't. The companies couldn't compete with places other. Uh, par uh, parts of the country and other parts of the world, and so they went, uh, uh, the companies pulled out. And it was a, a blame the worker explanation was almost uh, ubiquitous uh, when, we, when we came in. And uh, one of the things we did was to try to make available to people other explanations of what happened, some of which were very simple. Uh, uh, brass became largely re, uh, replaced by plastics. Uh, had nothing to do with wage rates. Um, the companies, local brass companies, had been purchased by na uh, national copper companies, and then they had been purchased by uh, international oil companies. So we had these old plants that were actually owned by uh, Arco and um, uh, other, uh, Sohio and other global oils companies um, who, they were just a f fleck of ink on a, on a balance sheet and they would just say, oh, we're going to close this. In fact, after buying all these companies, a, little, uh, a couple of years later, they said, well, we're, we're going to get out of, the, out of the copper business. And uh, so they just sold them all off. So we told the, that story, and we actually had community people uh, say, uh, okay, what was, what, t what was this plant originally? Uh, that, that, was the, that was the pipe mill, uh, and, and, what had, and it was owned by such and such a local uh, entrepreneur. And then they would go through each uh, company that had bought it until it ended up being owned by uh, Atlantic Richfield and told a completely different narrative about uh, how this community had lost control of its own economy uh, and been uh, acquired by people who had no interest in it whatsoever. The, mag the original owners, the magnates, may not have been uh, the most democratic and, and um, uh, friendly to ordinary working folks people, but they had a huge stake in the life of this community, and they didn't want to see it die. And, but uh, the companies that, that came in and bought it had no interest and were perfectly happy just to destroy the local economy. So that story, uh, interestingly, over the years became very prevalent. And uh, I, I remember going to community meetings where I would say, tell me the history of this uh, community and this plant and someone would begin telling me this story uh, and going through all of the history of it, of the acquisitions and eventual closing, and then saying, but if you really want to know about this story, go get this book called Brass Valley. <laughs> um, so um, let me uh, just wrap up, and there's lots more things we could touch on, and I'm very happy to respond to questions and comments and kick stuff around. Uh, but since we are in 
an academic institution, why don't I start uh, close by saying a couple of words about the theory of knowledge that underlies uh, a lot of this work for me. Uh, one part of it has to do with insider knowledge and outsider knowledge. Um, and the uh, anthropologists refer to this as emic and entic, but I can never remember which is which. Does anyone know? Entic is inside? Okay. Ready? Yes? Outside. Entic is outside. The knowledge from the out of the outsider has of a group, uh, and emic is what the insiders uh, uh, have, knowledge that they have of the group. But the, the core uh, point, and I should say my uh, description of what my role was, I was definitely in this community started as an outsider, uh, and I'm proud to say that by the time we were done, I felt like I was a pet outsider. Uh, but the community knowledge is the way I think of it, is really uh, uh, an extension of what, what you're, we were doing with that kind of project and the projects that uh, I, I mentioned before that people here are involved with. There's really the in, uh, uh, internal knowledge of the community uh, is largely, uh, very often takes the form of storytelling uh, and this kind of work is in large part an extension of a process that's actually a normal part of the, the life and experience of, of any, any community where people tell each other stories. Older people tell, people, uh, tell younger people stories about what happened before. Someone who was at an event comes and tells uh, other people who weren't at the event what was going on there. Uh, and then discussion that grows from that. It's just a normal part of everyday life of uh, uh, human beings. But, uh, so that's the inside part, and that's what's usually left out of uh, history as it's normally written. Uh, so most historians, if they were coming to look at the Brass Valley, would, uh, or were coming to look at uh, Washington, um, they would have uh, the mayors or the city councilors or the government officials uh, uh, who were calling the shots. That would be their way of thinking about it. And what this does is to say there's another whole other piece that needs to be included. And um, this is, and it's not going to be, you want to find a way, it's, it's pre if you find good documents about it, that's precious, but no, can't have it be. Uh, most of it you won't find uh, in conventional historical sources. But there's another uh, piece that is, uh, makes a contribution, and that is the outsider's view. Uh, Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, said, uh, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could be given the gift to see ourselves as others see us? And, seeing just the internal view uh, is not a full uh, knowledge of the story of a group, of a movement, of a community. How the people, an out, someone from the outside sees them is also makes a contribution to that. And the way I think about this is that it's very much a question of a dialogue between insiders and outsiders. Also, outsiders may bring skills and knowledge of a different kind. Uh, uh, so, for example, in one of these groups, uh, the, <coughs> had, uh, the, one of the students had been doing research on uh, the Civil War and the Civil War origins of one of these communities, and that wasn't something that people in the community were likely to have uh, 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 skills and uh, uh, techniques to go and do that research. So they brought something else into the community. It couldn't have replaced what the community knew, but it did bring another dimension to it. So dialogue um, and uh, the core to all of this in my mind is mutual respect uh, and uh, recognizing that other people know things you don't know and you know things that they don't know and let's have a process 
of learning from each other. Um, and the, the third element uh, is critical reflection. Uh, it's the idea that just because somebody who claims to have authority is putting out a, a, a story, a line, a narrative, a set of facts, uh, doesn't mean that you have to accept that. They, what they're saying may be right, may be true, uh, and when you look into it, you may discover, oh, it says this is, this is fine, but uh, it may also be that they have an ax to grind, that they have a blind spot, that there's things that they don't see, and this overall process is designed to support and generate critical reflection on uh, what we're told about history. Uh, and so just to sort of put this in a wider context, it's often said that knowledge is power. And I think that that is very germane to this kind of work. And this kind of work is about uh, uh, knowledge as power, but it's about a different kind of knowledge. It's about knowledge that is created through a social process in which there's not the empowered people who have the knowledge and then other people to whom they may or may not transmit it who merely have their own experience, which isn't really knowledge. Uh, it's about a process of creating a kind of knowledge that is rooted in people's experience, but not limited to people's experience that draws on a, a much wider range of sources also. And I think it's at its best, the basis, uh, that kind of knowledge is the basis for a different kind of power. It's a power that's not based on uh, authority that's given from above, uh, or just random uh, individual isolated perception and knowledge which leads to indivi uh, isolated individual responses to situations, but it's a kind of power that uh, uh, allows people to form mutual understandings, mutual definitions of what their situation is, and therefore be able to act on it in a cooperative and collective way. So, wide open for questions. Excellent. We uh, don't have a mic, so please speak up and go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, your work in environmental justice and your work on the green process. Sure. Um, so the um, uh, I've always been, you know, concerned about the environment. I grew up in the woods, and so the, <laughs> the environment is anything I've always been from the time I was a little kid conscious of, uh, and um, also I grew up in the uh, uh, early days of the environmental movement. I remember when the, all the vehicles, the cars and the trucks uh, didn't have pollution control devices and uh, horrible uh, pollution would pour out of the tailpipes. Um, and um, uh, the uh, so it's always been a part of my experience and way of looking at things uh, to be concerned uh, about environmental things. Um, the uh, knowledge about cl uh, climate change and global warming really goes back a long way. It was uh, pretty much ignored, but uh, I was there reading things 25 years ago, actually now 30 years ago, that laid out the whole impact and what, what it was going to be and everything that we're experiencing today was knowable. It's just people didn't want to know it. And so that really concerned and worried me. And I always, everything I wrote, I put uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, just like this is something we got to be aware of and think about. But I had no clue whatever what to do about it. Um, the, uh, then, uh, as the climate movement began developing, uh, I was uh, want, very much wanted to participate in it, and I was in the first sit-downs uh, at the White House for, uh, for civil disobedience in the White House around the KXL pipeline, 
uh, and um, uh, just sort of just as a as a person, as a uh, citizen and an activist. Um, so that's really my background on it. But um, uh, then I there there was someone I knew who had been a, a union official who was actually retired in order to play rock and roll, which was one of his passions, and to uh, try to get organized labor to take a strong stand on climate change, which was his other passion. Uh, and so he asked me to work with him. And so for most of that, for about a decade, I've worked with a group called the Labor Network for Sustainability, uh, which has been uh, we're, uh, working, organizing within unions uh, and the labor movement more broadly, uh, t especially to challenge the idea of um, uh, that protecting the climate is just going to destroy everyone's job, mm -hmm. which is the fear, very natural and in some cases valid fear. Uh, and climate protection, in fact, will create many more jobs than it destroys, but different set of jobs and there are going to be people who would, would be hurt by it and every job is important if it's your job. So a big part of our work is to have put forward strategies for how do you uh, see that climate protection policies are not going to destroy the lives of thousands and thousands of people and then how do you create a, a how do you create a political context where that will be part of climate plans and how do you persuade people uh, that might be might be victimized by this that there's enough commitment to protect it, seeing if they're not victimized, uh, to to allow them to be, you know, supporting climate protection policy. So that that's the backstory of it. And of course, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, uh, the the idea and even the language has been around a long time. I wrote stuff t ten years ago on the global Green New Deal. But all of a sudden, it has emerged for reasons that we could talk about, but I won't try to do that now. But it's become a huge uh, part of the national consciousness and discussion, which is like something that it's a dream, you know, something that I would have dreamed of not only 25 years ago, but a year ago. Uh, and so I, well, someday this has to happen. Well, it has. Uh, and uh, Labor Network for Sustainability was a, uh, approached by uh, Sunrise uh, to help build alliance with unions. Uh, actually, before the Green New Deal, the first sit-in occupation and the conjunction with uh, <coughs> AOC and all that, just, be, um, just w a month or two before that, and uh, I wrote a number of things that were in support of uh, climate jobs guarantee. Uh, and then once the Green New Deal broke out, I wrote uh, 12 reasons that uh, uh, unions should demand a Green New Deal. And I've been writing like crazy, to tell you the truth. I just did the thing on the Green New Deal uh, as a strategy for uh, creating more uh, equal American economy. So uh, th that's the, and I was just, a, uh, as Dan mentioned, I, there was a meeting with a fascinating group of people. So at 80 people, about half of them were, came out of the community movements and organizations, and half were what you might describe as policy walks. There were people with massive ex uh, expertise in energy policy, transportation policy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, academics, people in government and think tanks and so on. These were two very, it was a very big question what it was going to be like to bring these groups together. Uh, and it ended up being terrific. It was great. The, uh, policy people and the community people uh, regarded each other with great respect, treated, behaved, everyone behaved well, 
the things that you would expect of uh, uh, the policy people that they might be really arrogant and why are we bothering talking to these people? Quite the opposite. It was, uh, um, uh, you know, we we not we have part of the story, but this is going to have to be done on the ground by people like these people. And conversely, the uh, uh, community people did not say, why do we have all these uh, uh, people from the elite trying to tell us what to do? They were very open to the, okay, here's somebody who has some uh, knowledge that we can make use of. So it was, uh, ended up being, it started with a lot of tensions. Uh, but very rapidly, as soon as people started talking about the nitty-gritty concerns, they were very much uh, able to have a good dialogue. So, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my background is in literature and film. I, I'm not a historian. And when you were talking about storytelling, I was remembering experiences that I've had in small communities, villages, places where I've lived, where often the storytelling about the past ends up being somewhat fatalistic, like this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And it does create a sense of heritage and a sense of understanding, but it doesn't necessarily create aims for the future. Like, therefore, we have to. But you have had a real experience as an activist as well. So I was wondering how you negotiate that, like the telling the story, which feels like it's the past versus Right. Therefore, what do we now do? Right, and it's a, it's a, it's a very good question, and uh, many of these communities have a strong sense of defeat that they tried to do stuff and they were beaten down, mm -hmm. uh, so that which makes what you're saying even more, even more relevant. Um, the, uh, and I don't have a cut and dried answer to mm -hmm. it. I think that the. Um, and let me just and let me add that also the the faction factions and sores from internal conflicts in the communities are also a, 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 in a, are a sort of similar problem where we we can't do anything because of those people over there. Uh, so the so let me and we did we didn't take it as our mission to directly we weren't there as. Uh, organizers and activists. Um, so I don't think anybody who interacted with us would be in the, under illusion about who, who we were and that, that our, our motivation was certainly thinking that people in communities like that should have more respect and more power. But um, uh, the, um, uh, the, I think that the, the first thing we, the first answer I would give is those places where people were able to uh, uh, sit together, accomplish something, uh, win, win some battles. Uh, we were certainly try to hold those up as possible, even if they, what they achieved wasn't perfect. Uh, the idea that we can't do anything, we're totally hopeless uh, and helpless in this situation. Well, if you look at the history, there's a lot that's been forgotten and left behind that shows that that's only one side of the story. Um, the, we also uh, certainly always um, included in the discussion uh, what's the meaning of this for the future? Are there things that we uh, can do or, or could do uh, that would um, uh, draw on these experiences uh, to give us more power, more respect, more ability to cooperate for our common needs in the future? So it was that the question was always posed. We didn't really think it was our responsibility, or it wasn't our role to give the, the answer to it, but that was definitely 